Joining us now from our New York studio is Vatan Gregorian, president of the New York Public Library and a professor of history at the New School for Social Research. A prominent spokesman for the Armenian cause, Mr. Gregorian is currently working on a history of Soviet Armenia that is to be published by the Hoover Institution. And with us here in Washington is David Chikvaidze, an attaché at the Soviet Embassy here, where he serves as assistant to Soviet Ambassador Yuri Dubinin. Mr. Chikvaidze, uh, it seems to some Armenian-American observers uh, who have talked to us that the Soviet government has gone through a number of phases over the past few months, first seeming to encourage the openness of the demonstrations, then seeming to repress them, and now leaning back in the direction of trying to loosen up a little. Give us a sense of where the Soviet government stands with regard to what's been going on in Armenia. Well, uh, where we stand, where our government stands, is uh, that it recognizes uh, most definitely that there is a problem. Uh, there is a problem. It has to be addressed. Uh, the thing is, how do you address it? Uh, the way it was addressed these last few months is, uh, is an ugly way of addressing it, uh, with violence and with, uh, with victims and uh, even deaths. That is not, uh, that's not the right way to address it. It has to be done since it's a national issue, since it's a very uh, delicate and sensitive issue. It has to be addressed in a delicate manner and uh, over, a, uh, over a time. can be done overnight with demonstrations of that. Mr. Gregorian, explain to us in the simplest terms that you can what you think it is that Soviet Armenians are asking for. Well, for 70 years, uh, Armenians have been frustrated about the question of Karabakh because, first of all, they lost uh, their patrimony in eastern Turkey during World War I. Then they lost their wealth in the uh, Russian Empire during World War I as a result of Bolshevik Revolution. Then they lost their uh, foothold and their preeminent position in Tbilisi and Baku as a result of the emergence of two sister republics, Azerbaijan and Georgia. They ended up Armenians having a fatherland in the most underdeveloped country region of the Russian Empire. And then when it was Sovietized in 1920, the Azerbaijani uh, Communist Party announced publicly that Nakhichevan and Karabakh belonged to Armenia. That was approved by Soviet Central Committee, but it was never implemented. Let me stop you for a second. There is, it seems to me, a certain paradox here, an irony, and that is precisely at the time when things seemed to be loosening up in the Soviet Union under the policy of Glasnost. Yes. That is the time at which the demonstrations break out. Now, yes. in one sense, it's understandable. You don't have demonstrations at a time of, of sort of iron-fisted control. Yes. But against whom are these demonstrations intended? The demonstrations are against anybody, uh, nobody. Uh, that's the irony of it. One million people marched in praise of perestroika, carrying only Gorbachev's pictures. There was not a single anti-communist, not a single anti-Russian slogan, not a single anti-Azerbaijani. So the main uh, point of Armenians is that there can be no brotherhood without justice. So they're asking uh, Mr. Gorbachev and Communist Party of Soviet Union to redress a 70-year-old historical injustice done against Armenians on the basis of the fact that they have demographic majority, they have historical identity and historical justification. They're asking redressing a historical injustice that has been done. That's what they have asked. And this is incredible that uh, one million people will demonstrate there will not be a single anti-communist, anti-Russian. All of the uh, praise was heaped on Gorbachev and perestroika and glasnost. Now, Mr. Chikvaidze, what then is the political problem for Mr. Gorbachev? Here he's got then a bunch of loyal Soviet citizens who nevertheless are clearly emotionally involved in requiring some sort of justification of an age-old grievance, or at least a 70-year-old grievance. How does, he, how does he remedy that problem without creating new problems for himself? Well, that in a, uh, essentially is the problem. Uh, the most uh, unpleasant part of this whole thing is the fact that um, this thing is an aberration in our, in our national policy, in our life. It's not something that happens uh, every so often. Um, there have been some grievances before, not only in that part of our country, but never on this scale. Never with violence, never with, uh, with uh, loss of life. Uh, the problem here is that it is a, an issue that hurts 
it has to be addressed, and it has to be addressed uh, in, in, in a political way. We, uh, we, the, our party has uh, planned one of the uh, plenums, uh, plenary sessions of the Central Committee uh, in the near future to address the national question and try to resolve these problems. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back to you. But when we come back, we'll also be talking with Sovietologist Peter Frank who is on assignment at the Superpower Summit for British television. The summit agenda from Moscow as Good Morning America reports live from the Soviet Union this week. Peter Frank is a professor of Soviet studies at the University of Essex. He is attending the Superpower Summit as a consultant and commentator for Britain's independent television news. Mr. Frank joins us now live from Moscow. There is a point, Professor Frank, to which we alluded in passing at the beginning of this program, and that is that there are religious differences involved here also. You've got the Armenians who are Christians, the Azerbaijanis who are, uh, who are Muslims. How much of a problem does that represent for uh, General Secretary Gorbachev, who, after all, has a problem with, what, some 30 million Muslims in his country? Yes, I think that... In this particular context, it isn't a specific problem to do with religion. The fact is that this exemplifies cultural and historical differences, and this is the way in which these two countries gain their national identity. But the real problem, I think, is that having gained their national identity, this tremendous sense of national pride, that what is happening here is that this is causing tensions between them on a territorial issue. Now, where is this then going to lead? How much of a problem does this represent uh, for a general secretary who, after all, is trying to restructure the entire country, the entire economy, the entire political system? It's an immense difficulty for him, and it's come at a very bad time, just when he's walking a kind of political tightrope, trying to consolidate his own political power and get this very, very sluggish economy moving again. Now, the real problem here is, how do they resolve it? What are the mechanisms? Ostensibly, you have very democratic mechanisms, but that democracy hasn't worked for decades. Indeed, one would argue it hasn't worked for the last 60 years, and this is implicitly recognized in the recent theses of the Central Committee of the Party. And yet, the official position now is, you have to resolve this problem by democratic means. Now, the system just at the moment isn't capable of doing that and Gorbachev needs to tackle the system before he can tackle the nationality problem. On the other hand, the nationality problem simply won't wait. Now, let me come back here to Washington for a moment and pose to Mr. Chikviadze then the question of how does he keep things quiet enough in Armenia to buy himself the time to resolve the political problems that uh, Professor Frank was talking about a moment ago? Well, I don't think that it's a... Uh... Uh, it's a case of uh, buying time in one area to work in another. Our country is one country. We have one uh, leader. We have one, uh, well, one country. And uh, the problems are the same for everyone. Uh, the economic problem, I would say, was maybe one of the problems that triggered this whole business. Because uh, that Karabakh region was uh, rather underdeveloped and there were problems there in housing and other areas. That has been partly addressed. Uh, now, I'm not sure how satisfying that may be. Uh, I'm sure that it won't satisfy the whole order. But uh, things have to be done, and they have to be addressed uh, as they come. But I don't think that we can uh, sort of address one area and then make a breakthrough there and go on to the next one. Professor Frank, Mr. Chikviadze is, is talking about one country. Indeed, it is one country, but there are 15 some odd nationalities in that country. If the Armenians continue to press for a form of, well, let me ask the question first of all, are they pressing for any kind of autonomy? I think what they're pressing for is simply the return of Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. That really is the bottom line so far as this particular question is concerned. Now, naturally, if that were resolved in the Armenians' favor, then it's going to go against the interests of the Azerbaijanis as they see it. There's always a solution to these problems, but the problem is, in itself, that there are too many solutions, and these solutions are incompatible. But now, in the past, the Soviet solution has tended to be rather rigid and iron-fisted. The question, I suppose, the, the, the test that this represents is, is whether Mr. Gorbachev, under his new system, 
can bring some more democratic form of solution to bear. Can he? Well, there's a hint, hint, hint of this in the theses that were published by the Central Committee. It's a very unsatisfactory formulation, and what it seems to imply is giving greater devolution rather than autonomy to these regional areas, more economic independence, and certainly a great deal more cultural independence and linguistic independence, which is also important. The language is one of the cements of nationality. But I don't think that this is going to satisfy the Armenians, and as you say, out there in this great land there are other nationality issues just below the surface and if they were to break simultaneously that would present Mr Gorbachev with a huge problem I think however that some of these nationalities are exercising a certain degree of self-restraint because they realize that whatever chances they have their best chance is with Mr Gorbachev gentlemen we have to take a break we'll continue with Lee, a highly emotional issue we've seen that over the past half hour at the same point i must raise with you why would americans other than armenian americans care well uh, the issue is self-determination and uh, which is guaranteed by the soviet constitution here the right of self-determination the right of cultural autonomy human rights and others Armenians are asking self-determination within Soviet confines of Soviet constitution. But what I'm asking you is, while I understand that it is internally an important issue within the Soviet Union, is it an issue about which Americans who are not Armenian Americans should care particularly or have any particular oh, interest? I well, I think this uh, resolution of nationality question in Soviet Union is one of the most important questions. And if Gorbachev's reforms are going to succeed, some solution has to be found for the nationality question by updating some of the solutions of 1920s, which have never been updated. All these regions, autonomous regions, were created temporarily in order to avoid conflict between conflicting interests and conflicting repub republics. Now, 70 years later, we have demographic revolution, economic revolution, cultural revolution, and on the top of it, democratization, and uh, bringing perestroika and glasnost. So therefore, if we wish Gorbachev to succeed, we have to support liberalization policies of Gorbachev in case of nationality. Only a few seconds left. Professor Frank, I'd like to address the last question to you. To what extent does the rest of the world need to be paying attention to what's happening in Soviet Armenia right now? I think it's very important, but I think also that the rest of the world has to appreciate that Gorbachev has inherited a real can of worms. If one were to try to enumerate the number of problems that he has to tackle, then it would take all morning. And the point here, I think, is that many of these problems are really acute and potentially very volatile, and the nationality question is one of them. His problem, however, is how does he order the priority? What does he begin with first? Clearly the nationalities must be high on that agenda, but I think it's politically unrealistic to expect him to put it at the very top. All right, gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time. That's our report for tonight. My thanks to all of us, uh, to all of uh, our guests, rather. I'm Ted Koppel here in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.